Welcome to Raddu Shubuhat Podcast. I'm your host Kareem from the YouTube channel Ubaidullah the Tutor. And in this first episode, we want to talk with two guests about questions Christians can't answer regarding the crucifixion. In today's episode, we'll be discussing this topic with uh, two well-known Muslim apologists uh, and two very beloved people to the uh, Muslim community worldwide. Uh, they are Aqil Anqiu from the United States and Mustafa Ahmed from uh, uh, London. So the, the main topic of this podcast, uh, as I mentioned, is questions Christians can't answer regarding the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. These are going to be questions that are uh, amongst the toughest issues that are raised by Muslims and others in which Christians uh, usually don't want to discuss and actually can't answer for uh, the, the answers to these questions really destroy uh, the belief in such a crucifixion and uh, resurrection. Firstly, I want to send my salams to our two guests, Brother Aqil and Brother Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So it's an honor to have you brothers participating and uh, shedding some light on the issue of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus uh, with regards to the Christian uh, theology or the, or the way they see this and believe in this uh, uh, supposed event. Uh, let's discuss and start uh, by... Uh, Kind of getting your opinion and uh, maybe some thoughts on why is this in, uh, topic important to discuss and what are Muslims trying to gain by uh, uh, bringing up this topic? Are we trying to destroy uh, uh, the, the belief of the Christians in their hearts? Are we trying to t pull them away from God? Or is it something more loving and something more compassionate? Are we trying to build bridges instead of tearing them down? What do you... Uh, brothers think about this question. Why is this an important topic and what are we trying to gain through discussing it in this first episode? Brother Akhil, can you uh, start this, uh, in this discussion? Barakallahu uh, feek. Bismillah. Well, for us, the Muslims, we see that we have an obligation to humanity to call them to the truth of the deen of Islam. And I think in so doing, uh, at, at, um, highlighting or recognizing the falsehood where it is and trying to clarify it. As Allah has told us that the Quran is what is called Muhammad Ali and it's also for the Khan. So it has come to clarify the, the truth uh, from the falsehood. And, and it's such a pivotal uh, faith and belief and doctrine, something that can inevitably take someone to uh, eternal damnation if they believe the wrong things, then we find it um, in the interest of the Muslims to our brothers in humanity, the Christians, to try to educate them about the truth of the matter and explain that. So, no, it's not a matter of just tearing their faith down, but if there is falsehood that uh, has crept into their teachings, we like to try to clarify it for them, inshallah. And this is one of the issues. Thank, thank you for sharing that, Brother Aqil. Brother Mustafa, can you give me your uh, thoughts on this question? Why is this important for Muslims to discuss and to study and to... Uh, put forward these kinds of questions and issues uh, with their Christian friends and families. Why is this uh, an important issue to discuss the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus? Yeah, again, thank you, brother. Yeah, it is a really crucial uh, subject. Allah tells us in the Quran to inform uh, everyone regarding the truth. And the truth is what happened to Jesus, peace be upon him, as spoken, uh, as told in the Quran, it's a message that we have to pass on and give. When Allah says, Ya Ahl al Kitab, O people of the book, it's our duty to tell the Ahl al Kitab, the people of the book, give them the message and tell them the truth of what's really happened. Um, regarding the crucifixion, as um, Allah tells us that they follow nothing but conjecture, there is, there's already been a confusion going on between them throughout their time. Allah is now informing us to tell them this is what happened this is the reality this is the truth we're not stripping them down we're not trying to 
make um, make them feel uh, or degrade them or, or you know like strip their religion, nothing like that. We're presenting the truth to them. We're giving them our hand. We're not we're not we're not taking them out anywhere. We're literally presenting the truth, and um, it will make a big difference because think of it: the truth when the truth has arrived. Allah says in the Quran, truth has arrived and falsehood has perished. Then naturally we have to tell them what's happened and what will, what the consequences can be. Um, the truth from the Quran and it's only our duty to spread the message. Mm. Thank you for sharing that brother Mustafa. Definitely true and I, uh, and I definitely agree that the approach of bringing the truth without uh, sugarcoating it is important and also coupling that with what brother Aqil was mentioning in terms of kindness and uh, just trying to be uh, compassionate with how we talk about uh, the issue and being respectful as a former Christian, uh, these things were very important because no Christian or Hindu or any other from any other faith besides Islam comes to Islam when a Muslim is disrespectful or uh, not being compassionate or understanding towards uh, his uh, beliefs and worldview. So let's discuss uh, as a uh, as a introduction to the topic. Uh, some of the things that Christians really have a hard time answering in terms of the crucifixion and the whole narrative given by the four Gospels, uh, let's discuss some of the inconsistencies and uh, the question of are there truly inconsistencies in the story? Um, I want to go to Brother Akil and kind of get his viewpoint on this when whenever he's speaking to Christians, is it important to mention uh, inconsistencies? Does he truly find inconsistencies in the in the story, and uh, how does that affect uh, the whole religion and and w their belief system as a whole? So we're talking about inconsistencies in the story of the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, brother. How can can you? Yeah, in any story, if you have someone telling us um, something that is. Uh, allegedly historical, then we have to look at all of the, the strands that it comes to us um, and examine them. And when we have these strands uh, that are serious uh, contradictions uh, in, the, in the complete body, uh, this raises a lot of doubt and question about the authenticity of that story or narration. And when you look into the Bible, you know, we have the alleged belief that Jesus died on the cross and Jesus predicted his death on the cross and things like this. But when you actually read the story itself in detail, in comparison from one gospel to another, you'll come up with a completely different picture. And what happens is that the Christians, they read the story kind of, you know, harmoniously putting all four of them together and not really considering each independent narrative in comparison to the other. But when you do that and you read them in comparison to the other, um, there are some very stark differences, contradictions, that's irreconcilable, and this lends uh, serious uh, um, mistrust of the narration itself and the credibility of it as a, as, a, as a total story for us to believe in, especially when we have other faiths and proclamations that the fact the crucifixion did not take place like we find in the Quran itself. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Brother Akil. Uh, Brother Mustafa, I want to ask... Uh, we've, we've all heard, and I think that, uh, many Christians themselves have heard what, uh, people like Dr. Bart Ehrman has put forward in terms of inconsistencies in the story. Uh, do you think, uh, with regards to this topic that it actually matters? Some Christians may say that, uh, the inconsistencies are, are just small, minor details, and, uh, they may, uh, accept that there are inconsistencies, but then they say, well, we can trust the narrative as a whole. So do these inconsistencies in the story, for example, Jesus dying on one day in one gospel and on the next day in another gospel, uh, two uh, days in which he couldn't have died on both days, clear inconsistencies, do these actually matter or can we still trust uh, it, the Christians in, in, uh, as a whole, can they still trust uh, the New Testament and, and the information it provides? Do these inconsistencies actually matter for anything? Of course, definitely. They, of course they matter. Uh, think of it like this. You're, 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 the, the scriptures, the gospels are meant to be God-inspired. According to our Christian friends, 
uh, even the scriptures themselves say they're supposed to be inspired by the Holy Ghost or they're moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, if they were, if they were really inspired work, then we expect them to be bang on correct, word for word. We expect them all to give us the same message. You can't have, like you said again, one before the Passover, one after the Passover, or one moment Jesus is speaking to Pontius Pilate, another one he's not speaking to Pontius Pilate, one minute he gets arrested at this time, another minute he gets arrested. You know, it just doesn't work out. It conflicts. There's, there's contradiction and discrepancies. And, and, and the typical one that, um, that I came across was where I was told, no, it's like a newspaper. Um, if you had a football game and there's four different um, newspapers, um, article writing about the game, they'll obviously give their um, different views of how they saw the game. But th the problem is that the Gospels were written at different times. This is what they don't want to admit and they don't want to understand that they were written in different times by different people. They had different motives behind writing. For what? Matthew had his motive. John had his motive. Mark has his motive. I mean, think about it. We have scriptures from Mark that's missing. And then Matthew has continuation. He's adding bits on. So it seems like we, we've got a problem already. This can't, this can't be... Um, um, accepted as authentic piece of work okay it could be um, a, a biography that someone is writing about but then even there's a problem because they get borrowing it from somewhere else so there, there's no truth behind it there, there, there may be some bits and bobs like the Chinese whisper but truly speaking when you have discrepancies and, 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 and a lot of contradictions behind a, a narrative if you can't agree what day Jesus was crucified then there's a big problem there truly speaking you know, that, that's just straightforward. You can't agree what day he was crucified. If he was, um, if he had one guy mocking him and the other one not, if he had, you know, it just doesn't work out. So I think it does make a massive difference. You can't agree and you won't be, um, you can't take it seriously. I definitely agree, Brother Mustafa. Thank you for sharing that. I want to take the discussion uh, on a on a different avenue, if I can, and kind of discuss the a thing or the topic that uh, Christians really love to bring up when uh, Muslims confront them with these inconsistencies and uh, different aspects of the story. They usually say that the majority of scholars, uh, regardless of what Muslims say, the majority of historians, uh, they basically support and agree to Jesus being crucified. And uh, they, uh, Christians themselves love to raise this uh, fact However, um, I want to kind of get your your opinion on this, Brother Akil. Uh, can Christians be sure if there was a crucifixion in reality, if Jesus was put on the cross, can Christians be sure that Jesus died if he was truly on the cross? I mean, Chris, uh, Chris, uh, Christian scholars and non-Christian scholars alike amongst the historians say that a crucifixion took place and that uh, Jesus was the one crucified. So if we were to take this information, which in reality wouldn't contradict the Quranic story, as the Quran uh, mentions that uh, they have not crucified the Messiah, nor did they kill him. So it wouldn't contradict the Quranic story if Jesus was placed on the cross but didn't die. Uh, with, within your reading of the biblical text, in particular the New Testament, can a reader come... Uh, away with the idea that uh, people at that time, all the way up into our time, can be sure that the man Jesus, if he were put on the cross, actually died? Uh, Bismillah. This is a, a good question, and I think that we have to understand um, the reality of the Gospels itself and its historical narrative as it relates to crucifixion as well as history redacting the Christian narrative uh, to be an uh, issue of fact. So <clears throat> you have four gospel writers that narrate a death by crucifixion to a man named Jesus in the first century. And this is very clear from the Bible itself. But my contention is that, and this is supported by, uh, by biblical scholarship that look, that look at the event and things in the Bible, that Christianity is a product of a theology that was, uh, it, it promoted 
and concocted a story to suffice a theology that they wanted to uh, promote. Not that this is actually history and we are basing the theology off of his historical narration. And I, I'll give you an example. The, the idea that the crucifixion took place with Jesus, peace be upon him, and many historical uh, or hi historians narrate this to be a fact about Jesus. How can we ascertain this to be a fact about Jesus when we are undermining by default the fact that the gospel narratives are not reliable? If we don't know who wrote the first gospels as they came into existence, when they were actually written, by who, then how can we accept these narrations to be authentic and reliable? And history is only repeating, for the most part, what Christians have presented about the crucifixion in the first place. If you remove the Bible altogether from history with no narration about the crucifixion, then no scholar would mention anything about the crucifixion. So the historians are relying heavily upon the biblical testimony of the fact, but the biblical testimony of the fact itself is unreliable and, and, and unverifiable. So we have basically a redaction of something that was promoted from a theology, not from a historical perspective. And this is um, an example I gave uh, in, a, in a previous debate I had with a gentleman by the name of Pastor Angelos, is that if you have something in history that occurred and it was non-factual, but it was promoted to be factual and it became a dominant narrative, 50, 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years later, that dominant narrative becomes a standard. Even though it's a factual, it's not factual. It becomes history. People believe Christopher Columbus discovered America. We know he didn't discover America. When he got here, people were here. But according to history, he discovered America. So given that reality, we can see that in history, things happen that's not truthful, but they're later on promoted as truth. And I think this is a big contention that we have to, that we have to deal with. Right. Right. Brother Akil, you brought up some great issues, and I definitely appreciate you sharing that. I kind of just want to chime in on what you were mentioning in terms of uh, what history uh, says about uh, different events in the past that we cannot verify, and we can only really just uh, go upon what we think happened in the past. Um, I just wanted to kind of put put the thoughts out there to to our listeners that how many uh, cases of mistaken identity have happened during the past, even within our day and time. Mistaken identity. People have been put to death in, you know, and executed within the United States because of mistaken identity in terms of crimes. So it would really be a, a, a very understandable situation if people mistook someone on the cross for Jesus. And even on top of that, uh, if uh, Jesus were to be put on the cross, and this is actually a historical fact, then how many also at the same time uh, uh, instances do we know of, of peep and be people being assumed as dead and placed in the morgue? This literally happens within our own time. People are assumed as dead, placed in the morgue. Some people are even buried alive because people think they've died and, and they haven't actually died. So these, uh, like like you, you were saying, Brother Akhil, I really appreciate uh, how you put that, that just because people believe something in, in the past and spread that around doesn't make it true. It was just something people believed and became widespread. You know, we can never, we can never, uh, you know, assume that that's a hundred percent, uh, truth. And, um, and it's really comes down to just a, a faith based belief. Uh, so brother Mustafa Ahmed, I want to throw a question at you with regards to Jesus, uh, not really, uh, seeming in the biblical narrative as though he predicted his own death, even though Christians uh, always uh, like to mention these kinds of, of, of uh, descriptions in terms of how he lived his life and how he taught people. When we look at the bi biblical narrative of the resurrection, uh, and this ties into the crucifixion, uh, the resurrection narrative doesn't 
it doesn't really seem like his disciples in particular were expecting him to be resurrected. And uh, this kind of inconsistency and very strange aspect of the Bible kind of makes someone wonder, you know, why is this? Uh, you know, it's just one of those things that I think we can discuss and, and gain some benefit and some insight on. Uh, did Jesus actually predict his own death and resurrection in the Bible? Yeah, I mean, th this topic, I mean, Brother Achilles, he, he will smash this one. I mean, like I said earlier on, the problem that we have is that the, this, this, this topic about Jesus predicting his death, it, it, it was kind of like unknown to the, to the disciples and even the people. They, they, they were not aware. So suppose we read uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31. It said, then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Did, did you see, did you get this? That yeah. he was telling them, he's predicting, this is what's going to happen, but Peter took him aside and rebuked him. Why did Peter take him aside? Peter knew this is not true. Well, how, how could there be? You're the Messiah. You can't die. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and this is evident even in, in, in Gospel of John. And like, um, the, 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 uh, the crowd knew that the Messiah will not die. He will live. And, and so I think this is a really crucial topic where this is a, a predictions that would not have been said by Jesus. The, old, the, the, the Jews of that time, I mean, even Peter, Suppose we even took it that he was um, illiterate, according to Acts 4.13. The fact that he would have known about this, um, going to a synagogue and etc., and the Jews around him, they would have known that this wouldn't have been true. The Messiah would not have died. So it is a, a, a later developed story, just to just to um, put a theme inside. Do you know what I mean? Just yes. To, to make it more happening, more like uh, put this um, cinematic scene inside of that climax. No, something will happen. He mm. has to die. The scriptures say it. Fulfill mm. it. Yet they cannot show us from the Old Testament scriptures such a fulfillment should even happen. Mm. I mean, then it starts ending up going as Jonah three days, three nights. Even that wouldn't even be fulfilled if we were going to use it. So mm. I, I really don't take that as anything um, serious that Christians can um, and use because um, the Old Testament itself is evidence against them. And I think mm. Brother Akil, if you, um, he, he'll be able to expand on this even more. Yeah, absolutely. Brother Akil, we're going to ask you the same question. Uh, did Jesus actually predict his own death? Bismillah, if, <coughs> if you uh, even consider what uh, Mosifah mentioned, Allah bless him, uh, about when Peter rebuked Jesus about his claim of having to die for that, some Christians will, will, will try to wash this away by saying, no, Peter was just um, not... Um, he was not satisfied with hearing the news of Jesus dying, that it, it bothered him. And this is why he said that, like, you know, don't talk like this, so to say. Uh, and not the fact that he was rebuking him because this was something, uh, a contradiction to the theology of the Old Testament. But given that aside, let's give that argument to the Christians and say, okay, this is Peter's love for Jesus that he didn't want to hear the fact of him dying. But when we look at the, the biblical narrative of these um uh, these, these gospel uh, testimonies of the crucifixion and then also the legend of resur resurrection as well, you find that the disciples had no idea that Jesus was supposed to die because they were very shocked to see him back on the resurrection. You read, for instance, in the gospel of Luke uh, 24, 11, it mentions, it says, and their words seemed to them as idle tales. And this is referring to when the women, after they allegedly seen Jesus, they came back and told the disciples. They said that their words seemed as idle tales, and they believed them not. So the disciples didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected. Um, we have a whole um, a, a terminology, doubtful Thomas, because of one of the disciples didn't believe that Jesus was, was in fact resurrected. If I tell you tomorrow I'll be at your house at 5 o'clock, and I show up at your house at 5 o'clock, why would you be surprised? Didn't I tell you I was coming? If Jesus said it's a must for me to die, and then I will be raised up three days later, why when you see me three days later, you're surprised and you don't believe it when people tell you I'm raised up? So it's, it's, you can have these statements where allegedly Jesus prophesied 
his death and resurrection. But when you read the, 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 the intertextual uh, narrations, is, it doesn't add up. It's, I mean, all the disciples didn't believe. They all had doubts about it. And on top of that, Jesus accompanied some of the disciples for half a day. He even ate with them. They didn't recognize who he was. And then when they recognized who he was, they were afraid. They were shocked. Mary Magdalene, who was very dear to Jesus and very known to Jesus, when she seen him after the, the legend of resurrection, she didn't recognize who he was. She thought he was a gardener. Why would this be the case if this man is prophesying his death and resurrection, and then when he resurrected, the people don't recognize him, but they do recognize him, they're afraid of him, they think that he's a ghost, or they say that this is idle tales. What's idle tales? That he die and, and, and raise up again? If they believe this is idle tales, that clearly means he never prophesied and mentioned anything about a resurrection. Mm. Just to add that, sorry, Kareem, I just want to say that in John 12, 33 to 34, he said to signify the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd uh, responded, we understand from scripture that the Messiah will live forever. How can you say that the Son of Man will die? Just to say uh, the Son of Man anyway. So mm. even the crowds were aware that, hold on, the Messiah will not die. He, wh where did you get it from? Do you see what I'm trying to say? So to yeah. me, it seems a bit like dubious that one thing Jesus is saying, but the Jews around that time, they were not aware that this Messiah would have to die. Do you know what I mean? It, it's, it, yes. it, you see that they're correcting the Old Testament now. Uh, they're correcting the Old Testament by saying, no, it does say it, but there's nowhere to be found. So that right. is a, a great point. Yeah. And Thank quickly, on a, if I can, uh, I mean, that's a great point as well about the whole idea of the Messiah not dying. But this, I think, is, again, is where um, theology exposes history. That this is, this, this is a theological uh, fabrication that the Christians promoted. And they're trying to make history conform to that theology. But this is not really historical because this can't be the case. It's, it's so historical in so many contradictions. Again, another place in the Bible you find in Mark 16, 8. And they went out quickly and fled from the, the, the grave or the tomb. For they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to them or any man. For they were afraid. So, they, you know, this is something that they, they seen as to be... Um, um, unaware of, and you know, it, it goes on in verse eleven when they when they told the people, the other disciples, and when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, they believed not. Why wouldn't you believe me? Why wouldn't you believe these women giving testimony that Jesus has risen again after he said it? Every single gospel, it is written that the Son of Man must die, be harmed, and then raised up again. So it's clear that um, someone is not being truthful in his narration. Mm -hmm. And why would the people not believe in such an event when it was prophesied by Jesus in every single gospel? Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Brother Mustafa Ahmed and Brother Akil. Uh, you, you guys brought up some great uh, discussion points. And I just want to reiterate or kind of... Uh, tell you guys what I'm hearing from uh, this issue is that uh, the Christian stance is that Jesus predicted his death and resurrection, but the Bible makes it seem as though the disciples did not hear about these predictions and were unaware of them because they were surprised. Right. And that had he actually predicted his death and resurrection, they would have been surprised. And, um, and I think you brothers have made some really valid points, and I want to urge Christians also to consider that the disciples were already amongst uh, Jesus when he did other miracles. So it wasn't, you know, you can't say that they were surprised because it was so miraculous and, you know, people just don't come back to life every day, and so that's why they were still surprised. In reality, they would have been fully aware of uh, these kinds of miraculous things happening around Jesus and him being able by the permission of God to do certain miraculous things. So it wouldn't have been that surprising to them to see him back to life when he already brought other people back to life in front of them, according so, to the Bible. And quickly, real fast, they call the idle tales, according to the biblical narrative. They say this is mm -hmm. idle tales. I mean, this is like, who can believe something like this? Right. 
Absolutely. I, I thank you, brothers, again for those great uh, points. A uh, lot to consider there. We're going to move on to a detail uh, with in terms of the crucifixion itself and the event as it is happening. We have recorded in the New Testament a statement of Jesus, which was made while he was on the cross, assuming that he was actually on the cross. Uh, Jesus is... Uh, quoted as saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And uh, this is a very tough question for Christians because uh, one of their first talking points when they speak to people about Christianity is that Jesus died for people's sins as though he wanted to die for people's sins and um, as though it was the plan of God and, you know, it, it's something to, you know, be happy about. And that's why a lot of Christians wear the cross around their neck and uh, use crosses in, within their churches because they celebrate uh, the cross as though it's a good thing. So we have Jesus saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Kind of strange for a happy situation and a beneficial thing for uh, Jesus to say this. What, what are your thoughts, brother? Mustafa Ahmed, we'll start with you. What are your thoughts on this quote, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, I mean, this this has always been a problematic um, a statement, I suppose, that <clears throat> um, Jesus being the Messiah, uh, actually being forsaken, doesn't make sense. I mean, he's, he's meant to be the Son of God, and he's meant to be the uh, the, the main atoned, you know, redeemer, etc. And then he himself is screaming out, "Why you ha Why have you? Why have thou forsaken me?" I mean, it, it seems to me a problematic statement, but notice that if we go to the Old Testament, uh, like in the book of Psalms, uh, we, we find out that the, um, um, Yahweh, he would never forsaken his anointed one or, or, or his righteous people. He, they will never be forsaken. So if this is the case, according to the Old Testament, that the, the righteous, the anointed, the one that is fulfilling all the criteria and requirements, will not be forsaken, and Jesus, on the other hand, is forsaken, then, then that says a lot. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. One, one minute we've got God telling us he won't say, forsake the good guys, the righteous ones, the anointed ones, and next minute we've got Jesus being forsaken. Does that show a good part, a side of Jesus, or does that show a bad side? I mean, Christians normally say no, but he was supposed to take the curse upon us uh, upon himself, all the curse, etc. Again, it just doesn't work out. Because if he was willing to die, then, then he wouldn't be forsaken. He wouldn't cry out he's been forsaken. So that is a problematic statement. And, and I really don't um, accept that to be any part of gen anything genuine in the, in the uh, New Testament as, as being a, a, a man who's forsaken by God. And I'm sure I still can um, elaborate on this even more. Absolutely. I want to jump in before Aqil uh, begins his uh, comments. Uh, can anything be said with, along with the question of why did he say uh, this statement? Because it kind of conflicts with their theology of uh, Jesus being God himself and God and Jesus being one and basically wanting for this to happen. Uh, along with that, uh, kind of uh, strange quote. Uh, could anything be said about uh, the actual way that it's quoted in the New Testament? It's one of the very rare places that the, the language is actually kept in its original. And the word that's used for God or my God there uh, doesn't really sound like uh, the word Jehovah or the word Adonai or, you know, these kinds of other, other phrases. It, it kind of seems like the Arabic term of my God, we say Ilahi, and this one uh, in quoting Jesus seems like he's saying Eli. Uh, and, and, you know, the terminology seems very uh, similar. Could that, could anything be derived from that, even if this is not an actual statement of Jesus, could anything be, be said on uh, why they, uh, that, that this language that, uh, that Jesus spoke at the time, why does it have the similarities of, of uh, what we find within the Arabic language also? So it's kind of a two-part question there, Brother Akhil. Uh, Bismillah. Yes, the, the language aspect first uh, is very interesting. Um, I thought that um, it was like Eloi, which uh, is the Aramaic uh, expression of that. We believe that Jesus spoke Aramaic or Hebrew. Uh, 
So there's a difference of opinion about that. But okay, thank very, you for that correction, brother. Very, very, um, both of them are very close semitically to Arabic, um, as they are Semitic languages. So in Arabic, ilahi uh, ilahi lima taraktani, which is how we say in Arabic, my God, my God, why have thou left me? And I believe the phrase is Eloi, Eloi, Lima, Sabashini. Uh, so you can hear the similarity in the language. And it, it is interesting uh, that, that out of all of the statements of Jesus found in the Bible, why would you leave that one in its original tongue? Uh, it's just something, again, um, that you know, we find very intriguing about that. But even if we take this expression that the, the Christians used to say that this, he said this not because of, um, he didn't want, uh, he, 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 he didn't, uh, feel that God had stayed with him or protected him, but he was actually fulfilling scripture. And this is what I want, you know, uh, our Christians to understand is that when we read these things, we have to really, you know, read thoroughly and consider what's being promoted. If you're saying that this quote that Jesus exclaimed, allegedly while on the cross, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me, is a fulfillment of scripture. What scripture is that a fulfillment of? And when you look at it, this is a scripture that's found in Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 22. The very first verse begins, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? So the Christians say, you see, Jesus, this whole thing is fulfilling the prophecy from before. And this is why he said this. He said it only to fulfill prophecy. But the question we have, and this is very devastating to their, to their, on their claim, and I have another one that we're going to look at uh, next. But if you look at Psalms 22, it has uh, 31 verses. If you keep on reading through it, you see that this prophecy is quite the opposite of the idea of the Messiah being killed. Let's, for instance, take verses 11, I mean, sorry, 18 to 22. After talking about this event and God, you know, saying, trying, giving uh, tests, it says, so that 18, 22, 18 to 22 in, in Psalm 22, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture, which the Christians say that they tore Jesus' garments. But he, but, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise you. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. And ye that seed of Jacob, glorify him. And fear him, all ye seeds of Israel. And it goes on. So the thing is... Jesus, again, is asking for God to rescue him. He's asking for God to save him. He's asking for God to protect him from the snares of the enemy. Similar to what Jesus asked of God in the Garden of Gethsemane. And would we believe that someone so dear to God, so beloved to God, that will implore God to such a degree would not be heard and rejected by God? Would not God answer the prayer of his son? If you look at Psalms 91, this is also something that was a field of testimony. And again, I want the Christians to pay close attention because this is, this is where one part of the Bible is explaining the other part of the Bible. You go to Psalms 91 and put your bookmark there. And then before we go to read it, let's take a trip to Matthew 4, 6. This is where the devil tempted Jesus. The devil tempted Jesus. He took him to the mountaintop and he tempted him. And what did he say to him? He said to him, then, uh, so that verse 5, Then the devil take him up to the, the holy city and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he says to him, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, he should give his angels charge concerning you, and in their hands should they bear you up, lest any, unless at any time thou should dash thy foot against a stone. So the devil himself recognizes that no harm is supposed to come to the Son of Man. The devil himself. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said unto him, 
it is also written, meaning I confirm that, that the Son of Man will, will be protected by God. But it is also written that thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, what was being referred to here in Matthew 6, Matthew 4, 6, where the devil was quoting the, the old scripture and said it was written? He was referring to Psalms. And Jesus confirmed that what the devil said was correct because he said it is also written, meaning I confirm that, but it's also written this. Mm -hmm. In Psalms 91, Psalms 91, let's go to first verses 1 to 4 to get the context. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His trust shall, there be, thy, shall, be, shall, shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid. For the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by day. And it goes on. If we get to verse 11, it says, For he shall give his angels charge over you. This is the court of the devil, right? Hmm. To keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their, in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion. And adder, the younger lion, the young lion, and the dragon, and thou shalt trample under the, and they to trample under the, under your feet, because he has set his love upon me. He has set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. When you read these verses, it's clear that the Messiah, the chosen one of God, is to be protected and saved. And God will send angels even to protect him. Even the devil recognizes this. Mm. How wow. can we now say that the people actually killed him when Jesus is praying to God, calling upon God, and we're saying that God didn't hear him? God ignored him? Mm. The fulfillment of prophecy, in fact, is the fact that God saved him. Wow. And this is what Brother Musa was saying from John, is that how can the Messiah die? It's prophesied that he would not be harmed. Mm. So when they quote these things, oh, this is a fulfillment of Scripture, this is a fulfillment of Scripture, what fulfillment of Scripture? A word or the idea of God saving his beloved, his, his Messiah, his chosen one, his anointed one? Wow. This is a fulfillment. The fulfillment is that God rescued him, and this is what the position of the Muslims is. The Christians got it wrong. I just want to add to this, my friend, that um, um, going back to um, Psalms again, Psalms 26. Now this I know, the Lord gives victory to his anointed, bracket, Messiah. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with the victorious power of his right hand. Now, if Jesus is the Messiah, according to Christian, they admit he is, and Jesus cried out, why have thou forsaken me? then God would give victory to his Messiah. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary. So could it be, could it be that Jesus was on the cross, according to Christians, and then he cried out loud and God saved him? Could it be? And then they thought he was crucified. How do you know it's not? So God, for God, that's not impossible to switch places. It's not impossible. To be honest, God can do that. It's not something that is not a miracle. You know what I mean? It's, it, it can be done. You know, we're not, we're not saying that the earth had to, you know, like, uh, have a standstill and everything had to went round and upside down. No. Straightforward, it can be done. So if God is going to save his Messiah, and again, like John um, says, um, the crowd knew that the Messiah will live and not die, it seems to be a problem on the Christian side. Because they're not understanding the real fact. That's why the Jewish literature is full of it. The Messiah will, will live, Messiah will come, he will do this, he will do that. Why do the Jews reject Jesus because of this? They're saying mm. he cannot. Right? Wow. So yeah, I believe that is the truth. I've spoken to Jewish people. I've spoken to Christian people. I said, why do the Jews reject you? They don't believe Messiah died. I said, what well, do you blame them? Do you know what I mean? For them, he's going to come and save them. And, and you guys are saying you killed him. 
or they killed him. How could they kill your God? For them, that is blasphemy. Mm. I mean, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Both of you brothers have brought up some amazing points and uh, a lot to consider there also. While we're on the topic, uh, we, we just want to remind our viewers that we are discussing with Brother Aqil Anku from the U.S. and Brother Mustafa Ahmed from London uh, the issue of questions and topics that Christians really find it uh, really find hard to, to answer and in many cases can't answer at all. Since we're talking about and including what Muslims uh, tend to uh, believe in in terms of this could we discuss uh a little bit uh that 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 question uh if it didn't occur as the bible uh depicts this uh so-called and assumed cru crucifixion of jesus and resurrection of jesus if this actually didn't occur whether in totality or uh, in a different way uh what what actually happened what is the muslim stance on this and at the end of the day, if we don't have great detail of, of what actually happened, does it actually matter for Christians and Muslims? So it's a two-part question. What is the Muslim stance on what actually happened? And uh, does it actually matter if we ever get to the uh, nitty-gritty details of uh, who died, how, and uh, when? So, Brother Aqil, can you... Uh, uh, Put your inf uh, can you put your two cents, so to speak, in, in in terms of what do Muslims believe happened to Jesus, and uh, does it actually matter at the end of the day? Bismillah. All right. So, from the Muslim perspective, uh, no, it really doesn't matter if we know exactly uh, those details as it relates to the event, uh, because for us. Uh, the essential matter is that Jesus was not killed uh, and that God rescued him. But for the Christians, it's absolutely essential because their faith depends upon Jesus dying and being raised again. But when we look at the story, the story itself doesn't add up. So these details become very, very important in us trying to figure out exactly what happened if you're saying it did happen. Uh, so for them, I mean, they are in a, a serious dilemma that um, because according to their faith, if Jesus didn't uh, die and was raised up again, then everything about their faith is to no, is, is another and void. Mm. Uh, this is their belief, but this is not our belief. For us, it's simple enough that God say he was not killed, he did not die, and that's sufficient. Uh, but for them, uh, for them, this is most essential. And if their facts are not straight and their story is not clear and straight, uh, then they, they're the ones that have to present this argument to people and allow it to be digestible. And if, you know, you can't get your facts straight, like Mustafa mentioned earlier, what day did he die on? What time did he die? All these factors that we mentioned in raising, then this is very uh, consequential to the whole idea of believing this narrative in the first place. Hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Brother Mustafa, can you give us your opinion on this question? What do Muslims believe in terms of what happened to Jesus? And does it actually matter? No, you're right. So uh, Muslims believe what Allah has told us. Simply, that's the end of. Allah says in the Quran that Jesus, peace be upon him, he, he was not killed nor was he crucified. And Allah took him up to himself. Um, that, that's it. The, the, the thing, this is how I see it, is that the crucifixion of uh, of Jesus claimed by our, our Christian friends, it's because it's it's not true. It doesn't need to be elaborated anymore. It's only spoken of once in the Quran. It's not something that you need to elaborate. That's it. He 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 survived. He wasn't killed. He 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 didn't die. He wasn't killed in, as a crucifixion uh, uh, way. Allah took him up. That's it. It finishes there. It, ambiguous. You, now you can decide what you how you want to think. A lot of scholars have come up with opinions. And that's it. There, there is nothing more to it. So Allah has said, now we believe Allah's word to be the truth. Time can obviously, um, historically and time-wise, that's another case that we have to prove it. Uh, I've done a debate a couple of days ago where uh, I gave evidence that the stories prior to the crucifixion and after the crucifixion were made up stories, which means if the crucifixion is in the middle, that would have been a lie as well. 
Because if the stories before the crucifixion don't add up with to the crucifixion and the ones after, then the middle story is no good. That's the end of you. You won't be able to take it seriously. Also note that there was not any first century historians or eyewitness who saw the crucifixion. Everything like Brother Akil said is based on the New Testament. The historians will take it from the New Testament. They're not going to be taking it from um, anywhere else. Think of it like this. The crucifixion was a, was a common method of punishment. Historians will accept crucifixion was a common practice, taking a naturalist point of view, whereas the Christians will, will dismiss the naturalist point of view and instead take it, uh, instead take it uh, as, a, as a supernatural view, adding theology. So historians won't have a problem that Jesus was crucified. That's not hard to believe during the first century, a man opposing the Roman government, Jewish leaders getting caught and then crucified. Uh, it's not something astonishing or something big for historians. They would write the obvious. It's something common. The point here is to know is that if the historians are using a naturalist point of view, it just shows a lack of support that someone crucified on the cross could have uh, died for an atonement of sin, etc., that the Christians believe. So there had to be a method for the Christians to add this. If the scriptures, if, if, if Mark, Mark, uh, Mark, supposed to have written about 40 years later, then how accurate was he when he wrote about it? He could have started his own theology. Do, do you see how it is? That, that mm -hmm. it's easy to start your own um, um, a movement. Right. You just need to write about it. That's all. He wasn't aware that it's going to be really scriptures. He just wrote about it. Right. Who is he? We don't even know the bloke. So he could have just said, well, actually, Jesus was crucified and so and so, so and so happened. And we're taking his word for it now. Mm -hmm. So in reality, we can't prove it in the first place that if he was crucified. So do you see? So we, what we're doing as Muslims, we're trying to add things together like that puzzle, like jigsaw. Right. So Allah is saying us he wasn't crucified. Right. That's it. Allah is saying it. Now, Muslims, was he crucified? Okay, let's investigate. So, did the trial of Sanhedrin really happen? Did so and so really happen? No, it didn't happen. It couldn't have happened. Oh, okay, doubtful. Did, did and Josephus take his body down? Did Josephus even exist? Oh, very doubtful. Did he do this? Did he do that? Oh, very doubtful. Allah is saying they follow nothing but conjecture. Do you see the problem that we're having here? Mm. That they've already got problems within their scriptures. So they right. cannot be taken as granted anymore. So right. for that sake, we can even dismiss the crucifixion even happening. And, and, and so uh, uh, if you're already on dubious grounds and you're standing on, on, on a bridge that's already about to collapse, then you don't have any, uh, there's no way you can start pointing fingers on Muslim by saying, oh, you guys got it wrong. You guys can't even prove it yourself that you have them. You know what I mean? Right, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely agree. Definitely agree. And as a former Christian, and I, I, I say this with uh, all humility, um, you know, the, the, all of these topics that we're discussing, uh, culminate and, and come together within the Christian theology and the way they see God and the world. So we're going to end the podcast with a question regarding theology. And the question is, does God dying, uh, Jesus uh, claimed by Christians to be God, does God dying on the cross and resurrecting, uh, you know, does God uh, in this predicament, having to die for the sins of people who have uh, or who are the ones who sinned against him, him himself uh, decided to kill himself. Uh, does this make sense? Um, and of course, I can speak for a long time on that because I, I myself have uh, I left off that belief. And, um, and I say that in all humility with, with love in the heart for our brothers and sisters and humanity will still believe that. Um, however, I, I just want to, you know, get some food for thought from you two brothers on does God having to die by being crucified and resurrected, does this actually make sense? Brother, okay, I'll, 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 if you want, I can start from Brother Akil. Okay, can absolutely. No problem, Brother yeah, Akil. I'd rather get Brother Akil with his um, acad uh, academic way he can uh, finish this off. Now, um, does it make sense? No, of course not. So this is what this was my question to my uh, to one of my Christian friends that um, that did God create the heavens and the earth? Yes. So God was the sole creator of the heavens and the earth. Yes. Did God create the humans uh, also? Yes. So was God able to forgive the human beings who committed the sin himself, or is that an impossible act? If a if a 
if a god can create the, the heavens and the earth, the universe, the actual solar system, can you imagine how large of a scale we're talking about now, God mm -hmm. created everything. He is the sole creator. He created these puny little human beings who have sinned. Could God, was God able to, uh, is this God able to forgive their sins? Of course. He can wrap it all up if he wants to. No problem. It would not affect him. He is not liable for any questioning. He does whatever he wills. Allah says in the Quran, فَعَلٌ لِمَا يريد. He's the doer of all he intends. He can create what he wants and he can destroy what he wants. No one questions him. So he does not have to die for the sins that for, for which he created himself. He's the one that would have been created through him. So I, I find that as a super problematic. The, the answer that I get from Christians is, the scriptures have to be fulfilled. This is absolute nonsense. What scriptures? How can the script? Well, how do you under, how do you justify this? The scriptures have to be fulfilled. It's God who created everything. He doesn't have to follow scriptures. He he created the heavens and the earth, and he created these puny human beings. Why would he have to die for something that they've done? Wouldn't it be more just if he forgave them? If not, he could have just recreated another creation again. You, you, you're, you're scaling God to a level that he's become a human. He has to become like a human. No, you're being selfish now. Because you, what you want to do is you just want to push your sins to somebody else. That's what you want to do and you're selfish. You don't care. You really don't care who it is. Whether it was a Jesus or if it was a man or a, or a woman, you don't care. You just want to push your sins on them. And that's how it is. Someone has to take the sin. Well, if you come to Islam, then those sins will go away. Allah is Al-Ghafur and Al-Afu. Ghafur, that He covers your sin. Al-Afu, that your sins are disappeared. He, he takes your sins away. They disappear. They don't exist anymore. So why not come to Islam, the most easiest way for your sins to be forgiven? No blood is needed. And there's no need for any God or anyone to die. Simple end of. That's how I can finish it. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brother Mustafa. That was an amazing uh, eye-opening uh, comment from you and we definitely appreciate you. Before we end with our brother Aqil, who's definitely going to take us out on a good note, I just want to chime in on my own, uh, uh, you know, kind of journey from Christianity to Islam and, uh, looking back at it, uh, to say that God in, in, in the theology of a Christian had to die for the sins of others, it's, uh, you know, if you were to kind of rationalize uh, that action with a president, for example, who makes a law, uh, for example, if someone uh, rapes uh, someone else, he's right. liable to death. If this is his law, and then, you know, he wants to pardon a person, or even something smaller than that, because Christians uh, kind of generally say that all sin, no matter what it is, the, 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 Consequence is death. So something even smaller, say someone jaywalks, and, and according to this president's laws, any infraction, the, the consequence is death. But since this is the president of, of, the, of the land, he wants to pardon someone. Will it be a wise action? Would it be something that is praiseworthy for now the president to say, in order for me to pardon this person, I'm going to have to come down into the person's neighborhood and, and have someone kill me? Because someone has to die. You know, we, we would say that this would be madness if someone actually did it. But we're saying at the same time, as Christians, as our Christian friends and family do, that God actually did that. That he wanted to pardon people from a law that he uh, established himself, so he had to harm himself. He couldn't just pardon the person as a, as a president would or as a king would. Someone had to die, and he thought it wise for him to kill himself. You know, this wouldn't be seen as a wise or praiseworthy thing to do. It would be insanity to, you know, if this actually happened in real life. But Christians believe that God did that. So, you know, it, it just takes a little bit of deep thought and, you know, courage to, to look at uh, our beliefs as Christians and, and, and you know, really reevaluate them. So, Brother Akhil, we're going to end this discussion with you. Does it really make sense for Christians to say that God had to die uh, for the sins of people who sinned against him. Uh, Bismillah. Uh, first, you brothers, alhamdulillah, uh, thank you for the time and, and um, energy and 
examine this matter here, inshallah. Uh, it's very crucial, as you mentioned in the beginning, it's very important for people to understand the severity of believing uh, something that's not true before God and be accountable for it uh, in the eternal realm. Uh, and to close on this point, uh, I think is, is, is most essential. Uh, the idea of God dying for sins, uh, God is almighty, first and foremost. So the idea of God dying in and of itself is blasphemy. I mean, just to begin, if you stop there, we didn't even say anything else. God cannot die. But in, uh, along with that, let's, let's, let's examine the Christian doctrine, as Brother Muslim mentioned, that the Christians love to say this is part of Scripture, fulfilling Scripture, fulfilling Scripture. But when you look into the Scripture, we find that the Christians continuously say something is fulfilling Scripture, but the Scriptures say quite the contrary. So I want to end on just reading a few quotes from Scripture, the same Scripture that the Christians quote. If you look at Ezekiel 18, you go to Ezekiel 18, you begin at verse... 20 and it states Ezekiel 18 20 the soul that sins it shall die the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon him but if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, says the Lord, and that he shall return from his ways and live? This is what God is saying. Change your ways, mend your ways, and I'll forget what you've done in the past. But if you continue in that, then it will be upon you. But I'm not going to hold anyone else responsible for someone else. If you've done something wrong, then you will be held responsible for your action. And if you've done something right, then that will be for you. This is the scripture. The ones that the Christians always say Jesus came to fulfill. How about what we find in Isaiah? Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. This is what the scriptures say. This is what God say. And let us close with something that is very clear. In Hosea 6.6. 6, God is speaking. For I desired mercy. And not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. God wants us to turn back to him in repentance if we do wrong. And if we do that, he will forgive us. Not someone come die for the sins of humanity. And especially not God himself. God Almighty becoming incarnate in a form of a man to come and have to pay the sins for the humanity. This is, un this is unscriptural. This is against what scripture say. So the next time the Christians tell us, oh, Jesus had to do this to fulfill scripture, what scripture are you talking about? And let's examine that scripture and really see if that scripture is saying what you're saying or something different. And we looked at almost every point where they talk about scripture, and it shows quite clearly that Jesus, if he came to fulfill scripture, that means he had to be saved by God from being harmed and killed by anybody which means he didn't die for anybody's sins, which means the Christian faith is null and void. I'm a, I want to thank our two guests, Brother Akhil Anku from the U.S. and our brother and uh, fellow colleague in uh, Islamic apologetics, Brother Mustafa Ahmed from, the, uh, from London. Uh, great discussion. We're going to leave you with the Islamic salutations uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Until next time, peace be upon you.